If you love ancient history, then this is the channel for you. History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but dedicated just to ad-free history documentaries, including a huge library of ancient history content from the Ninth Legion to Boudicca to the First Britons. Now you can get a huge discount on History Hit TV today. Simply check out the details in the description below and make sure you use code Odyssey on sign up. Anyways, on with the show. Footprints of Civilization. When we look back on our past, we can see them everywhere. When we say our past, that implies a past which we can all share. The legacy of the civilizations that prospered around the Mediterranean, such as ancient Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Rome. You don't have to be a genealogical descendant of any of those cultures to live in their long shadow. Their traces are all around. So-called ancient history spans a period of around three and a half thousand years, from the beginning of written language in around 3100 BCE until the fall of Rome in the fifth century CE. We can find a lot of ourselves by examining those worlds and those societies. From ancient society, we have taken many good things. We've taken democracy. We have taken law. So far, we have never encountered any civilization which didn't have trace of religion. So religion is one of the most common elements that we find in basically all the civilizations. In ancient Egypt, there was a plurality of deities, divinities, polytheism. The ancient Greeks, the inventors of Western philosophy, the inventors of democracy. One of the famous questions that many Greek philosophers posed, what does it mean to live a good life? What is a good life? What is being happy? What is leisure? All these things. Some might suggest that we today are perhaps more similar to the ancient Roman, measuring quantitatively the quality of life, which is ironic. And that primarily had to do with land ownership and what you can do with land, namely growing crops and grazing animals. Though that all seems a long time ago, this series aims to bring that world a little closer. When we look at these ancient societies, we actually find uh, quite a number of uh, places, cities that were extremely multicultural. Alexandria at its peak was an extremely multicultural and extremely tolerant uh, city with a multiple of ethnicities, religious traditions, very vibrant culture. In a sense, Alexandria would remain dead up to, we could claim, modern days. One of the building blocks of any society is religion. Consider the massive gatherings that take place in its name, such as the crowds of up to 300,000 people that assemble in St. Peter's Square in the name of Christianity. 
Faith has continued to evolve over the centuries. Today, the dominant world religions seem to share the concept often called the golden rule. Though that might not seem to have much in common with ancient beliefs, at their core, all religions have something in common. What does this word religion mean? Two words, to bind together again. To bind what together again? Members of society. We can all think of examples where faith has divided nations and peoples. There are dark chapters, such as the Crusades or the Spanish Inquisition. For early man, alone in the dark, with every day a battle for survival, the belief in a maker and an afterlife must have provided some comfort and meaning to an existence that was cruel, brutish, and often short. Primitive societies were essentially polytheistic in that they believed in many gods. This was an attempt by these societies to make sense of the natural world. Each god represented either a particular element, the sky, the seas, the lands, or indeed parts of the land. What they did when they could not understand a force of nature, they identified this as a god. That is a power beyond their understanding. Most of these gods are very different from divinities uh, that we know today. These gods are not particularly benevolent gods. They're not gods that exist or are assumed to be beneficial to man. The pyramids, majestic reminders of the cult of personality and the enormous power of Egyptian pharaohs. We normally tend to divide these areas between religious sphere, political sphere, economic sphere, cultural sphere, and so on. Ancient societies didn't think about religion in that way. Religion was something closely connected with everyday life, closely connected with human society, with politics, with culture. Though the pharaohs were flesh and blood, they were considered gods on earth and part of the divine family of about 2,000 gods. Mummification, embalming, and the pyramids were all meant to preserve their remains. Belief in the afterlife shaped the lives of ancient Egyptians. From the archaeological evidence, it seems to suggest that the Egyptians were obsessed with the afterlife. We must temper that a little bit by thinking in terms of regeneration, because a lot of the Egyptian stories of their gods deal with death and resurrection. This idea that preservation of body is important because it somehow ensures a future life. We'll also see in this idea something that has direct political implications. Because what it means that when a king, pharaoh, dies, that he somehow still exists, ensuring the survival and well-being of the state and its stability. Maybe we can look at the afterlife as something that actually is there to ensure stability and well-being of their society and their state. We take for granted that most religions today worship only one divine entity. But our ancient forebears would have found the idea of one god as strange as we find the idea of many gods. Ameno the, the fourth tried to establish an early kind of monotheism, worshipping the Aten, which is the uh, solar disk, basically. That was an attempt at establishing, at introducing a sort of monotheism. That was an experiment he famously attempted right around 1000 BC, and it would not be seen again for another thousand years with the ancient Romans. 
When we look at various religious systems of both the ancient world and also modern world, uh, we actually don't find their monotheistic religions and then polytheistic religions. Actually, what we find in reality is that there is a variety of different religious systems that are somewhere in between those poles, between something that we could call strict monotheism and then a polytheistic system or even some religious systems that don't even have a god or gods. Christianity is one of those cases where uh, there is, technically speaking, one god, but then there is the concept of trinity. Uh, which is not really a completely uh, consequential monotheistic system. The religion of ancient Egypt certainly made a lasting impression. Today we can see tangible remains of their faith. But what about the other great civilizations of the Mediterranean? The Greeks and Romans more or less believed in the same set of gods and goddesses. The Romans changed the names of the Greek gods so that Zeus became Jupiter, Poseidon became Neptune, and so on. But the underlying principle was the same. The gods were believed to be one big happy family. Or were they? They're brothers, sisters, sons, uncles. We have Jupiter, Juno, Zeus and Hera, actually a brother and sister, husband and wife. That in itself is going to lead to complication. And if we think of them in terms of a modern dysfunctional family, then we don't have any real problems in understanding the warring factions. Because like any family, they fight, they make up, they fall out again, they're in love with each other, they're out of love with each other. Though the Greek and Roman gods were overtaken by Christianity, they were never quite forgotten. Christianity is a synthetic religion. It borrowed from ancient religion a great deal. It borrowed from ancient philosophy because during the evolution and changes in the Roman Empire, the elite class and the literate class eventually, as the population become more and more literate, abandoned their devotion, their recognition of the ancient gods and religious practices, and turned more and more to philosophy. Hellenism was introduced into the Roman cultural world in the third, fourth centuries BC. And uh, Hellenism means Greekism, making Greek concepts, Greek thoughts, Greek architecture, Greek philosophy, uh, Greek language, a universal, broad, cosmopolitan culture. It's not unlike Americanism today. And speaking of Americanism, where would the most powerful economies of today be without their wealth? Superpowers are not built on ideals alone. Money is another cornerstone on which society is built. The New York Stock Exchange, Wall Street. On an average trading day, Shares worth billions of dollars are bought and sold here. The bidding wars taking place on the bustling market floor may look modern, but they have their origins in something much older. Prior to using money, what we call money, as an exchange instrument, the economy rested and moved on the basis of exchange of goods. From its inception, money was a way of simplifying trade. Money made it easier to calculate the value of products. There is no fundamental difference between those ancient civilizations and the way we think about money and what money brings nowadays. We can actually see that very often, as we all know, money and social and political power go hand in hand. It is widely believed that the first gold coin to be used as currency was created by Lydian King Croesus around 550 BCE. He lived in a territory of Lydia, 
where he was king, and that's a center of trade. That is in the southwest of Asia Minor, of Turkey today. That's where many different cultures met there. They had Phoenicians to the south, to the north, the Hittites, to the west, uh, people from Cyprus and even Egypt. Coins allow a statement of value where all of these people can trade with one another and they know that there is a given value to a particular instrument. It didn't take long before the divisions between rich and poor, have and have nots, began to emerge among human beings living in settlements. Today's hedonistic life lovers can trace their spiritual ancestors to the sensualists and pleasure seekers of ancient Rome. But even then, having a great deal of money was never enough. You were expected to flaunt it while doing anything to acquire more. Though the ethos of conspicuous consumption was not the noblest footprint of civilization, there's no doubt it had staying power. the access to elegance, uh, the access to gold, the access to wealth, to money, to perfumes, for example, and so on, it's really connected to the social class uh, you come from. So this is a footprint of civilization. The fact that uh, the higher is the social class you belong to and uh, the easier is uh, the way you can access or can have access to these kinds of uh, products or materials, such as marble, gold, amber. Today the difference in social class is a little bit uh, smaller or lighter than uh, it was or than it used to be at the times of the Romans or the Egyptians. The uh, wealthy social class uh, was much smaller as far as the ancient civilizations are concerned than uh, it is uh, nowadays. It was much more diverse, and we have cases where actually people at the bottom of the social pyramid, that they acquire wealth, even slaves acquiring wealth, both in Greece and in Rome, that would allow them to buy their freedom, and then they could be free citizens and participate in trade or even in political life. Today, the wealthiest people in the world control the markets because they are the markets. The people who influence all the power in the world have a net worth of billions and billions of dollars. They're not the first. The net worth of Marcus Licinius Crassus was said to equal the budget of the Roman treasury. Obviously Crassus, famous right before the end of the, the fall, the collapse of the Roman Republic, often referred to as perhaps the wealthiest human being, at least in the ancient world, if not maybe all of human history. Centuries before Marcus Crassus, and certainly by the time of the old kingdom of Egypt, class distinctions were set in stone. At the top of the social pyramid was the pharaoh, nothing less than a living god. Next came members of the nobility, followed by high priests and government officials, all the way down to the slave class. The question was, is one's fate decided the day of one's birth, or was social mobility possible even in those times? There wasn't much of an upwardly mobile class in ancient Egypt, but later civilizations had a little more room for self-improvement. Ancient Greece, not even somewhere between ancient Egypt and ancient Rome, was just very different. Ancient Greece, city-states, never a unified monolith like the Roman Empire would become. 
a number of city-states with vestiges, at least vestiges, of tribalism. Therefore, everything is kept local, but as one might imagine, within such a reality as a tribe, even if it sound a little better calling it a city-state, there certainly will be elements of that class distinction within each city-state in ancient Greece, but not on the vast level that it would have been, certainly in ancient Egypt or the class disparity in ancient Rome. Within the context of Roman civilization, there was the possibility to pass or to shift from one social class to the other. We also need to bear in mind that uh, some VIPs, like uh, emperors, for example, very often uh, came from uh, such high rank. Diocletian, for example, he came from a poor family from uh, Dalmatia, but also Augustus, the famous uh, Emperor Augustus, the first uh, Roman Emperor, came from a uh, family, the gens Octavia, which used to be of uh, plebeian uh, origin. Later on, we no longer find Roman emperors being Roman or indeed Italian. We have Spaniards, Trajan and Hadrian, becoming emperors, and we have emperors from North Africa, for example, Septimius Severus. In ancient times, being born a male was another distinction that marked one out for advancement. Let's compare the role of women between those societies and today. We keep forgetting that in most of the Western societies, women acquired the same legal status only in the 20th century and in some of them only uh, by the mid 20th century. So that's less than one uh, average human life. Ancient Greece is widely acknowledged as the birthplace of democracy. But a democracy where voting was a privilege extended only to property-owning men and excluded women. Women behind the scenes could be dominating the household by the way they run the household. But we have to think in terms that the wife could be divorced by a word from the husband and dismissed from the house, and a daughter was considered a father's property. And when the daughter was married off, the wife became the property of her future husband. So in many ways, that seems to limit the woman's role in society. However, in practical terms, that doesn't seem to have been the case. Sadly, human nature probably hasn't changed all that much. Undoubtedly, there have been strong women ever since there have been women. They very often were part of myth or mythology. If we consider the example of the Amazons, of uh, which Herodotus uh, speaks, uh, so we have an interesting example of women who were considered to be very strong, very powerful. We can also mention important individuals who, although strictly speaking, were not part of the ruling class, but were equally influential. Uh, famous mothers, wives, who actually very often led to important conflicts. We can mention they are also Cleopatra, who appeared at that crucial moment in Roman history when basically two leading generals were part of the story about Cleopatra and the succession of the Roman throne, essentially at the beginning of this period that we call Empire. The infamous Cleopatra was, effectively, the last pharaoh of Egypt. Scholars believe that up to six women may have ruled ancient Egypt, either in partnership with the pharaoh or on their own as empress. Among them, Nethhotep, who Egyptologists have deduced by the colossal size of her mastaba, or tomb, and her royal crest, that she was the de facto ruler of the first dynasty of Egypt. Then there was Mernaith, at first an empress regent, who then possibly ruled in her own right during the first dynasty of Egypt. And Sobekneferu, 
who ruled Egypt for four years after the death of her brother Amenemhat IV. Nefertiti, she of the famous bust, is believed to have ruled as regent with her pharaoh husband, Akhenaten. There are interesting connections that we can make uh, between the role of women uh, in the classical times or in uh, the ancient times and the, ro the role of women today. If we consider the role of uh, contemporary uh, female uh, politicians, we see how relevant uh, their uh, ideas, the policies that they try to develop uh, actually is. Male or female, make no mistake, the pharaohs of ancient Egypt were absolute rulers. To oppose them was to oppose the will of the gods. When would ordinary citizens get to have a say in their own affairs? The foundations for the modern day concept of people equality. Democracy, famously forged in Athens, Greece in the 8th century BC, ruled by the crowd, ruled by the mob, quite literally, which has the unfortunate consequence that if out of any given number of people, a simple majority rules the day. Around 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, the populace worked out a way of governing themselves, a concept we recognize today as democracy. A regular and compulsory gathering of male citizens met at the assembly. There, anyone could speak, including proposing laws. These laws would be debated by the Council of 500, made up of citizens chosen at random to serve in government. Not unlike our jury duty today. And finally, there was the court. This was true people power, or more correctly, man power. One thing to keep in mind that uh, all these democracies were in some sense restricted. So women and slaves were excluded. Aristotle himself said the slaves were, were just walking animals, were talking and walking animals. So the Greeks had a very, very firm and strong hierarchy which never changed. You, no way, you could live forever in Greece as a foreigner, and there were many foreigners you could never enter in and identify as a Greek. As they so often did, the Romans took from the Greeks in adapting their own democratic system. The ancient Romans modified, tweaked the Greek model of democracy, inventing a little something known as the Constitutional Republic, right, which is a representative democracy among other things, allowing for the minorities within such a society to nevertheless have a voice. The Roman Republic, with its consuls and senate, and its ideas of checks and balances on power, was destined to last a long time. The Republic would endure for nearly 500 years. The Senate would still have an important role in running the empire, even after the rise of the emperors. The Roman governing system has been emulated for centuries. In fact, the establishment of the highly esteemed United States Senate was influenced by the Roman model. The three quarters of the world today has uh, Roman law. So in some way, Roman law uh, penetrates the mentality and the social structures uh, classes of those societies. The ancient Romans' point of departure in Roman law was finding equitable, balanced, harmonious, as best as possible solutions for all members of human society, not based on religion, divine revelation, or any particular philosophical model, but based on a rational, logical approach, critical thinking. The other thing is exactly what Roman law has always been lauded to have produced. That is, things like justice, freedom, liberty, equality, equitability are fruits of Roman law. So the idea that uh, uh, nobody should be sentenced uh, 
to any uh, any penalty before he or she has the right to defend themselves in a public court is something that we would still, at least theoretically, affirm nowadays. Together with that, we should also keep in mind another important concept of citizenship, because citizenship defined who are those who have certain rights with, within a certain political community. Uh, initially, uh, a Roman citizen was of course just a free citizen of Rome, no matter what class. There were also procedures uh, through which even slaves could become uh, Roman citizens, and as the empire grew, uh, it actually uh, started applying the concept of citizenship to more and more people, including people who are of different ethnic origins. The road to political power in the Roman Senate was naturally different for wealthy patricians than for lower class plebeians. The manner in which the Roman democratic system, such as it was, operated, fostered a clear path to corruption, favoritism, and double dealing. Perhaps some of that sounds familiar. Roman and Greek society is predicated upon a huge slave population. We mustn't think of slaves as one blanket nation. The slaves could be manual laborers, or they could be refined teachers of rhetoric in an elaborate household. They could be gladiators, or they could be road workers. There were, in fact, times when people rose up against the system they were under. One obvious example was the slave revolt led by Spartacus, and another is Tiberius Gracchus. What the Gracchi brothers try to do, basically to give some portion of uh, land uh, to those who didn't have, so it's uh, rather modern. So there is a kind of footprint of civilization. Why? Because uh, there is a modern kind of attitude in uh, the attempt to equalize social classes, in the attempt to give something to those who didn't have that much and in the attempt to try to limit the way in which wealthiest classes were trying to become uh, even wealthier. Even democracy has its downside. There are many visible footprints of repeated human mistakes and failings. The rise of the strong man who overthrows democracy the ascension to power through the ballot box, only to have democracy undermined from within. These are the political staples of the 20th century and the parallels in the downfall of Julius Caesar. For the Romans, the dictatorship was an emergency measure in extremis. When the political situation, usually foreign policy had broken down, somebody was needed to come in who was all powerful, who could literally dictate, say, how things were going to be. And the original office was just for six months. Caesar may have seen himself as a benevolent dictator. However, that's virtually a contradiction in terms. He first of all makes himself dictator for five years and then dictator in perpetuity. That is, he's made himself a king. Caesar was murdered, ostensibly, to save the Republic. Sadly, the civil war that followed produced unintended consequences for his assassins. The Senate would still wield some power in Roman society, but Rome would from now on be ruled by imperial dynasties. Though Rome had been a republic for nearly 500 years, 
it would be known for its highest achievements and excess during the first 400 years of its empire. History always seems to repeat itself. The Roman emperors left their indelible footprints on our civilization. Following Germany's loss in World War I, the town of Weimar declared itself a republic. They drafted a Bill of Rights that gave men and women the right to vote, and also protected freedom of speech and religious beliefs. So far, so good. But we all know what happened next. A system of proportional representation allowed fringe parties like the National Socialist Party to gain a foothold on power. A clause in the new constitution allowed the elected president to use extraordinary powers in an emergency. Ironically, what constituted an emergency wasn't defined. Hitler exploited this weakness in the clause, and as a consequence, the world would suffer. In contemporary times, I would say that some elements of some, what are referred to these days as populist movements, are very similar to some of the ideals within ancient Greek democracy. Power back to the people. Again, the problem being that sometimes that can be taken to an extreme or certainly a non-productive productive path. What, in fact, does democracy need of society in order to work? The answer is people. Today, big populations made up of different ethnic groups with varying beliefs live together in the same town. Is that a modern concept or an ancient one? Can we find another footprint of civilization? In the ancient world, the separate nations of Egypt, Greece, and Rome seemed more like they came from different worlds. The Egyptians built pyramids. The Greeks debated democracy. And the Romans lived to excess in their villas. But reality was infinitely more complicated. Trade, war, and population migration would cause the ancient peoples to intermingle as they traveled. Arguably, there were multicultural empires even before. If we think about Persia, the uh, Persian Empire was uh, multicultural and was also pretty, from what we know, pretty tolerant when it comes to the existence of various ethnicities and various religious groups uh, within the Persian Empire. Uh, then we also have, of course, uh, Magna Grecia, which was uh, primarily a uh, Greek empire, but was encompassing all these regions with a variety of local traditions and, and different ethnicities. And we have a Roman Empire, which uh, was one case that is closest to us and most significant for the later history of the West, uh, for which we can truly say that it was something uh, open to inclusion of various cultures, various ideas, various, we could call it, lifestyles uh, nowadays. A legendary story about the beginnings of multiculturalism comes from Macedonia and of its legendary warrior king, Alexander the Great. Alexander, of course, was a great conqueror. Indeed, the great conqueror. His empire included Greece, Macedonia, the Middle East, and most of Egypt all the way to Afghanistan. In keeping with the standard practice of his era, whenever he conquered a territory, he infused it with the Greek language and its custom. Something else was also true. As a rule, he and his armies never sought to absorb the cultures they encountered. One exception was Persia. 
Though Alexander thought them to be his bitter enemy, he sought to unite the two peoples with a mass wedding that lasted five days. He had many of his generals married off to Persian noblewomen. The Macedonian-Persian marriages were intended to be symbolic, but also to unite these rival nations in blood. After all, any new offspring would be children of both civilizations. I'm afraid he favored, like all the Greeks, um, a very narrow definition of a society, uh, the ethnic basis of a society. Uh, I do not think that this famous incident uh, where he married off his officers uh, to local women uh, is um, a very valid basis for saying he uh, was creating a multi-ethnic empire. But subsequently, he becomes a symbol of that, interestingly enough. At the very least, it was short-lived and a failed attempt because of his own death and perhaps the greater proof that human society was not quite yet ready for such an experiment is precisely because his own generals wound up immediately in fighting and basically destroying what Alexander had created. It really would not be until really the ancient Roman Empire that for the first time what we could identify to be a multicultural experience within one societal governmental reality exists and that is one of the genius inventions of the Romans. The Romans realized and capitalized on the notion that let's not be exclusive, rather let's be uh, inclusive. When the Romans conquered a new province, they really didn't tamper with government that much. They put in their own governor, but as long as the native government worked and worked well, the Romans left well alone. I think this, uh, this model uh, was proven very successful because it allowed, instead of exclusion of everybody who had a little bit of different religious practice or ethnicity or even language, to be included into empire and then toward uh, the third century uh, AD uh, to come to the situation when all these different ethnicities can actually climb up to the very top of the social structure and still be considered Romans and uh, the state still be considered the Roman state. Sport is one activity that has always brought people together. The modern Olympic Games, a testament to humankind's ability to temporarily put their differences aside and compete. The ideals of friendship, solidarity, and fair play have become known as the Olympic spirit. obviously begun uh, in the ancient world, in ancient Greece in particular, and would last until effectively shortly before the collapse of the Roman Empire, so at least a thousand years. Everything stopped in that period in August for the Olympic Games once every four years. Huge crowds were attracted to Olympia for the Games. there was money involved, betting, all those things we associate with modern sports, people were making money on it. But for better and for worse, it was a real recognition of human individuals' need and a collective need to ultimately realize we're all in this together and that maybe somehow through a competitive, a sporting, but also sportsman's like attempt at engaging one another, regardless of race, race, ethnicity, uh, geographical location, class in society, uh, wealth, that we can all recognize that we're all human beings and we're all, we're all part of something much greater than ourselves.
sprints, and horse races were the events of the first recorded games that took place in Olympia in 776 BCE. Longer foot races were added later, as were sprints wearing full armor. Eventually added were track and field events that combined running, throwing, and jumping into multi-event competitions. The pentathlon comprised five such events, and the decathlon was made up of ten events. The major difference between the games was the brutality of the ancient games. Um, bare knuckle fighting for the boxing, the wrestling, again not allowing eyes or biting, and then the ultimate kickboxing wrestling mixture, the pancration, which was a fight that could all could and did sometimes lead to the death of one of the competitors. Nevertheless, the popularity of boxing has never waned continuing to attract millions of enthusiasts without regard to ethnic origin or socioeconomic status. The best and worst of human nature was on full display in the ancient world. Those empires or those states or those societies that uh, were proven to be successful, at least in a certain uh, period of time, that it grew, uh, grew economically, culturally, and also politically. It's all very well for us to judge their folly, cruelty, and excesses. But what would they make of ours? Uh, there's never been a time in history uh, since antiquity when the values, the movement of people, the diversity of people, the encounter of cultures has ever been greater than today. Perhaps it's safer to commemorate their considerable achievements and the footsteps of civilization they left behind. Ancient society multifaceted has given us good points and some bad points. We've learned from the good points, we've refined the idea of democracy into an all-inclusive idea with votes across gender, race and creed.